Okay, we're starting Yigera Satshuva, the next section of Tanya. So it's always good to give a little background and a little understanding of the objective, because each of the sections of Tanya, they do feed into each other, and yet each one of them has their own distinctive objective. Now, the Yigera Satshuva that we have before us was actually written in two separate stages, and it's known by the Aramaic terms Madura, which means the form Kama, the first one, and Madura, the form, Basra, the second one. The second version, timely, was written after the Alter Rebbe was released from prison on Yates Kislev, which we just commemorated, of course, last week. And uh, as we know, everything about the Alter Rebbe's um, approach and his um, instruction and so forth began anew and with the renewed vigor and so forth after he was released. Um and that was already this a new stage of the dissemination of Hasidus, uh, a more sort of fr- uh, 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 free-ranging one, et cetera, whatever we'll call it. And um, the Alter Rebbe was, uh, incorporates that in his uh, s- uh, second section of Igera Satshuva. So we'll perhaps see some of that as well. Um, now, the Igeras HaKoidesh, which is a later section in Tanya, which was a series, is a series of communal letters, was not added by the Alter Rebbe. That was added by his sons at a later publication date. And so it has a little bit of a different tone to it. And the Igeras HaTshuva, which we're reading now, again, always is going to follow the theme, which the Alter Rebbe enunciates uh, on the title page of Long Short Way, Long Short Way. Uh, so there's a, a lot of background that's necessary. And as you recall, the metaphor that it may take a long time to get there, but when you get there, you walk right through, as opposed to what we might think of as the short, long way, which is more of a quick fix. Historically, people used to learn Yigera Satshuva even before they learned the Seva Shalbaninim, Again, following the pattern that the Alter Rebbe himself enunciates in the Seif Shal Bainanim in chapter 17, where he describes that the Russia has to do tshuva before he can reinstate his innate love for Hashem. So just a quick reminder of the context there. The Alter Rebbe asserts, of course, that every Jew, it's today's chitas, has an actual part of Hashem that is embedded within him. And as such, it is absolutely intuitive for him to be desirous of being close with Hashem. Just as a child naturally longs for his parent, so too uh, a Jew naturally longs for Hashem. Everything longs for its origin. What happens? So just like the the physiological systems that, uh, God forbid, enough damage can be done to them so they lose their natural functionality. Uh, God forbid a person eats poison so his natural system for digesting food or his blood system or whatever can become corrupted. So before we can just sort of set him back on his intuitive path, we have to reinstate his natural healthy uh, format. So we can't just sort of pick up from where we're supposed to be. We have to um, reinstate or reinvigorate their natural health state. Well, the same is true spiritually. A a Jew is born with a natural desire to be aligned with Hashem. It's impulsive. But what can happen? Enough potato chips, enough indulgences, and that natural desire to be close with Hashem can become corroded. And we can't just sort of drop right in and start uh, afresh. There's got to be some repair. Uh, We could think about it even in an interpersonal relationship where if one person... uh, let's say, misses uh, or is less than attentive, well, if they start being attentive to a friend, then, you know, they just sort of pick up and they fix it. But if there's been some sort of harsh violation of the relationship, we can't just pick up like as if that never happened. It needs to be a repair of what's been broken in order for there to be a process to move forward. And so there was uh, a, a, a philosophy that you should learn the Geras HaTshuva and do Tshuva first to sort of get back to baseline health and from spiritual health and from baseline spiritual health we become uh, eligible to move Progress. forward what happened we become eligible to move forward um, 
uh, okay, but we, you know, we're learning it in this in the system the way it's printed. Like we talked about, the Alter Rebbe considered printing and public publishing and publicizing the Shaykhid Bamuna first, because he thought, well, maybe you need to know who God is before you can know about how you can have a relationship with God. But then he said, well, we're so eager and pretty uh, desperate for having that relationship that we're going to start with that. And then exactly who God is, we'll sort of figure out next. Well, the same thing with tshuva. Uh, so here we are with the these communal letters about the idea of tshuva. One of the um, primary messages associated with the Gerasa tshuva and with Hasidus' contribution in, to understanding of tshuva is that tshuva is not just for sinners. There's a sicha from the Rebbe where he quotes, uh, you'll recognize from the high holiday davening, the Unasana Toikef, where we declare, Utashuva Tefilu Tzedaka Mavir Nesreya Hagzera. And the standard translation in every uh, machzer is through repentance, uh, prayer, and charity, we can overturn the decree. And the Rebbe explains that the English words repentance, and the same is true for prayer and charity, do not fully capture the uh, the message of what the Hebrew word means. And they're essentially not Jewish understandings of these processes. Repentance means that I am bad. And since I am bad, I have to stop being who I am. And I have to be somebody new because I'm bad. What's the evidence that I'm bad? I do bad things. So since I do bad things, that's evidence that I'm bad. And if I'm bad, I have to stop being me so I can stop being bad and I have to become somebody new. So this manifests itself in all types of lingo, turn over a new leaf, uh, start again, and so on. Hasidus explains that the word tshuva, just a basic Hebrew word, means to return. Shuv, the, 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 the root word of it is shuv, is to return. The difference between return and repent is, repent says that I'm bad, I have to become somebody else. Tshuva says, I have gone away, I need to return. So this returning is not just because I've done something bad, I mean, that too, but the innate state of being suggests that I can always be closer and closer with Hashem. Baruch Toshev El Elikim, the Pasuk says, the spirit will return to Hashem. So Igeris HaTshuva is um, about the tshuva uh, concept of endless opportunity for returning. In fact, it, even when one of the quotes regarding the, the time of Mashiach says that Mashiach will come to bring the tzaddikim to do tshuva. So of course we say, well, what do you mean? Tzaddikim don't do averis. So one understanding is, well, you know, even the tzaddik can always uh, be better. But it's not about being better. It's about this endless pursuit of being closer in alignment with the infinity of Hashem. So the Pasuk, Baruch Toshev El Elikim, this Pasuk underscores this idea that it is forever our obligation and opportunity, the opportunity is probably a better word, to be closer with Hashem and thus, to uh, to engage in tshuva, not just because we did something wrong. There's a half joke, maybe it's even somewhat serious, that when a person davens myriv immediately after Yom Kippur, so we say in that davening, like we say in every davening, slach lanu avina kichatanu, forgive us Hashem, for we have sinned. So the person says, well, what do you mean? We just had Yom Kippur, we, didn't, we completely cleared the slate, so I better do a quick sin so that I can have something to say slach lanu. I mean, that's like I said, it's more of a joke than it is actual, but it, it fundamentally underscores the, the distinctive uh, uh, understanding of Hasidus in contrast to, without Hasidus, the narrative level, that tshuva is for sins. If I did something bad, I have to do tshuva. If I didn't do anything bad, I don't. Now, curiously, <clears throat> as we will discover in the beginning of this chapter, tshuva is a mitzvah. <clears throat> like any mitzvah. And therefore, it has rules, like every mitzvah has rules. It's not just some sort of uh, arbitrary or, or, or um, ambiguous conceptual uh, philosophical idea. It's got rules. But one of the rules is itself up for debate. Is tshuva a mitzvah? 
Meaning, if a person does an Avera, are they required to do tshuva, or tshuva is an option? You don't do tshuva, you can take the punishment. <clears throat> so, it's is it a corrective or is it not? We have a halacha just to illustrate this point. We know that for violating prohibitions, there can be lashes. However, we have a rule of thumb that if there's a remedy given in Torah, then that takes precedence over lashes. For example, if a person steals, so that is a violation, and Torah says they should they should return the stolen item. So we say, well, Torah tells you what the remedy is. We turn the stolen item, and therefore it's not for lashes. But what if the guy says, no, I'm not returning the stolen item. Give me the lashes. Meaning, <clears throat> you're telling me that I have an option to do tshuva. I don't want to exercise that option. I'll, I'll suffer the consequences. <clears throat> so back and forth, as you can imagine, it goes. Conceptually, though, what the, 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 the issue here is it becomes bargaining now. Meaning, how bad a punishment is it? I mean, we all make these, not us, of course, but we all make these kinds of deals. I know I'll eat this ice cream. And I know that it's off my uh, regiment. Well, tomorrow I won't eat anything. Or I know I'll spend this money. I know it's outside of my budget. Well, tomorrow I won't buy something else. So <clears throat> is that uh, acceptable in Torah to make these sort of deals? Well, so one, one position could be, yeah, you know, it's up to you. You're going to suffer the consequence. Tshuva is an option. Because tshuva conceptually is, we'll talk about, really becomes, and we this is true in interpersonal experiences as well. I mean, it's essentially sort of beyond the rational. How is it that if I did something bad, I can do something and undo it? I mean, how do I reach into the past and undo it? I mean, it's done already. It's true, I can fix it, but how can I undo it? Okay, so we will uh, venture out into some of these areas and some of these ideas. The Igeris HaTshuva, these letters, and the fact that they're called letters as opposed to the Sefer Shalbaninim, uh, suggests a certain uh, almost temporariness about it. Now, when we say letters, it's not like a letter a person writes to his friend, you know, hi, how are you? Hope everything is well. These were a means of communication. They would dispatch these letters. I mean, our Rebbe did it as well. They would send out these communal letters to all the children of uh, of Israel, wherever they may be, in honor of Rosh Hashanah or Pesach or uh, Yud Beis Tammuz and so on. So this was a traditional form of public instruction because how they didn't have, obviously, recordings and so on. How else would you get the word outside of your immediate environs? So they would send these communal letters. Concurrently, the term letter has a little bit of a temporary quality about it in contrast to a bound book. Now, it's kind of curious in our world where <clears throat> everything, you download it, you delete it, you download it, you delete it, but there is a certain substantive quality to buying a book. Now, there's real investment in contrast to just a letter. One of the explanations as to why the Alter Rebbe called it Igeris HaTshuva is because there's a certain temporariness about tshuva, because when the Geula comes and uh, the spirit of impurity is removed from the earth. So there won't be the same necessity for tshuva, but there still will be a different level of tshuva, again, the endless pursuit of the unattainable and our ongoing desire and effort to be aligned with the infinity of Hashem. The, the 12 chapters are, are, are divisible into basically three groups. The first couple of chapters, one through three, are going to speak about the parameters of tshuva much like Hasidus often emphasizes, that Hasidus is not something separate from the legal narrative of a, of a concept. Well, the same is true with tshuva. So we're going to lay out some of the parameters of what tshuva really means, again, halachically, because it is a mitzvah like mezuzah and kosher and Shabbos. It has rules. There are rules to what makes Chuva, chuva, and in order to understand that, we got to map it out. We got to lay out some of that parameter. Then the middle chapters, four through eight, we're going to start talking about some of the Hasidis behind chuva. And we're going to go like almost completely off the board of the literal and the narrative and the legal. 
And we're going to speak about sort of spiritually what goes on when we do tshuva. And then the last couple of chapters is going to be the interface of the two, how the Hasidus of tshuva and the legality, the observable, the nigla, what's evident, what we can see of tshuva, are really one and the same. How they're not uh, just two separate ideas, both called tshuva, but they actually fit together, like we always talk about the body and the soul. And this is a, a very good illustration of this general rule that Hasidus isn't here independent of the narrative, like we have Medrash and we have Kabbalah and we have Remez, but it's designed to illustrate the integration of both concepts to, uh, concurrently. That is, the, the, the do's and the don'ts, the nuts and bolts, and the intense infinity of Hashem as it is blended into it. So we'll discover this together. So chapter one begins with the halachic basis of the process of tshuva. Why does Alter begin here? One is to give the reader a, a framework. And again, to understand that from the, like I'm calling it the nuts and bolts of tshuva, it becomes a looking glass into the infinity of tshuva. It's a halacha with all the other rules. It's not just some sort of ambiguous concept. So we begin with a, uh, a lesson, a summary of the Talmud. And it begins with the word Tanya. Now we know that the word Tanya is a reference to something that is taught in a Mishnah. Just a quick review. You recall, of course, that when Hashem gave Moshe Rabbeinu the Torah, he gave him the oral explanation of what he was talking about as well. There is no idea that's completely self-contained within the Chumash. When it says, uh, take a beautiful fruit on Sukkot, it doesn't say what it is. Hashem explained that to Moshe orally. When I say beautiful fruit, I mean an Esrit. When I say uh, 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 to fill in, it means the four boxes. When I say write them on your doorpost, it means these two paragraphs of the Shema. That's the oral law. And that's how it was transmitted for generations, teacher to student, teacher to student. Until Rabbi Judah the Prince, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, he saw that due to the exiles and the infiltration of uh, foreign uh, corruptions and just the distance we were getting from Sinai, it was getting too complicated and, and, um, uh, and lost. So it was time for it to be written down so there could be an absolute centralized text. And that is called the Mishnah. And again, later they wrote the Gemara, which is the analysis of the Mishnah. So as uh, part of the, the, um, the lingo, whenever we see the word Tanya, that specifically references something that is taught in a mission. So that's, of course, Tanya, the name of the book, which uh, is taken from the first word of, uh, 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 from the, the, about the oath administered to be righteous and not wicked. Here again, it begins with Tanya. So here we go. And this, this uh, Mishnah apparently just to, to, is, happens to be in the, in the volume. It's called Yoma, which means day, which is a reference to Yom Kippur. We have a whole volume of Talmud that's devoted to all the aspects and laws of Yom Kippur, primarily the service of the Kohen Gadol in the Beis Hamikdash, And as it often does, the Talmud sort of veers into um, corollary and related issues, including this idea here, about um, the laws of tshuva, the concepts of tshuva. So Tanya B'Seif Yuma, at the end of the Masechta called Yuma, we learned, Shlesha Chaluke Kaparahe. There are three forms of, and he uses the word kapara, which you recognize like the word Yom Kippur, same word. There are three forms of atonement, uh, of correction. V'tshuvim uh, Kolecha. Now, every one of them requires there to be tshuva. Now, it's worth noting, for a moment at least, what is the objective of atonement? So we have this debate, even the Havdil in the secular world. What is the purpose of consequences to crimes? Meaning if a person commits a crime, what is the purpose? So one is, we say, it's a deterrent. You know, if people know that they're going to have a, uh, going to pay a penalty, they don't do it. Why doesn't the person go through the stop sign? Because they're going to get a ticket. So one is it's a deterrent. And if we don't enforce it, then the deterrent becomes a mockery. That's one. Another is that it's retribution. That society is 
uh, gratified by retribution against the criminal. That if a criminal just goes free, even if he pays for it, and we all sort of uh, can can mock at the, the person who goes through the stop sign, says, I don't care, I'll pay the fine. What do I care? Um, so again, there is a violation of the societal arrangement that this person has uh, violated the community, and therefore the community is entitled to retribution. And then there is the, the aspect where Torah really puts a lot of emphasis, or at least Hasidus puts a lot of emphasis on Torah, which is that it's reparative for the violator, that the violator has somehow incorporated this characteristic upon his identity, and he needs some form to be able to cleanse himself and to repair it. So again, take it at the, at, at the micro level. If you have a, a child and he does something that he knows he shouldn't do, he steals something, he breaks something, whatever it is. So he gets caught. So that's it. If it in the child's eyes, well, I guess that's it. I'm branded forever as a thief. What is the mechanism for me to ever be able to uh, ex uh, uh, expel this uh, character trait. Well, that's why we give him a path to do tshuva. So the, the tshuva is designed, A, for punishment, it's the, designed for retribution, and it's designed primarily in Torah's perspective for repair. And that's why it says here very clearly that tshuva in kol echa, because there is the vulnerability that, okay, you caught me. What do I got to do? How long I got to stand here? And then I get to go home. So a person could say, look, I'll, I'll pay the penalty. It's easier for me to violate and pay the penalty than it is to comply. So there, there's no, so again, at the human level, that's what we have. You know, we give the guy a ticket for double parking and that's it. We something, if he pays his ticket, that's it. It's, it's exonerated. You know, as long as he pays his tickets, we 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 don't prosecute him any further. Uh, in contrast, what Torah is saying is there's no tshuva, there's no repair. He's still a double parker, and on the contrary, he's he's now uh, put a price tag on it, and for fifty dollars, it's worth it for him to double park. And it's just a it's just a deal. So we don't want it that way. We don't want it to be that way in the service of Hashem. And that's why there has to be tshuva together with all forms of kapara. Now, the books of the prophets of the Nevi'im are filled with these um, criticisms of these worthless offerings that are brought without any changed character. And uh, th this attempt at sort of bribery or compliance, um, etc., that, that it's filled. Torah, uh, the, the, the books of prophets are filled with this. So this is what is underscored here in this quote from the Gemara, that they're all forms of tshuva. What then is the purpose of the actual penalty? Meaning if the person does tshuva, why does he have to also bring the sacrifice? Why does he also have to have some sort of financial penalty or social or societal penalty and so on? Let him just do tshuva. So we'll learn about that. I mean, for example, what, that jumps off the page is the story with Miriam, uh, Moshe's uh, sister, who gets the punishment of Tsaras, and she's exiled from the camp and so on. So why do you have to go through that? Just do tshuva. So we'll see. You know, and even halachically, it's worth noting there's some discussion about whether the Bezdin can pardon somebody from a punishment based on the person having done tshuva. On the one hand, we say, well, sure, the whole purpose is for the person to do tshuva. So what's the point of punishing him now? We know we have confidence that he won't ever do it again. On the pushback, we say, well, how do you know? You don't have the capacity to look within his soul and know maybe he's just faking it. Maybe he's just sort of tricking you and telling you about how uh, remorseful he is and so on. So we'll see. Okay. So here we go. Overall, mitzvahs ase. If a person and it's a curious uh, usage of the term, violates an obligatory commandment. Now, that's kind of odd because you can't really violate an obligatory. You can just ignore it. So, for example, there's an obligation to eat matzah on the first night of Pesach, and the person doesn't eat matzah. So he's missed the mitzvah's assay opportunity. He missed out on an opportunity. The shav, but now he does tshuva. 
So here, as we'll note later on, it seems rather odd. That's it. You can never undo that. Meaning if somebody breaks something, you can fix it or replace it. But if somebody misses something, you can't undo it. Yet, by doing tshuva, he will not be dismissed from there. That is, it's a sort of colloquialism until he is forgiven. Meaning he's forgiven immediately. Now, it's worth perhaps at this point notice, noting that the word moichel, which is the standard translation of the word uh, uh, for the word forgiveness, or it's translated as forgiveness, the word itself it gives us a, a, an insight. The, the root of the word, you know, every Hebrew word is rooted in two or three letter um, uh, 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 root words. The root of the Hebrew word moichel is from the word chalil or chol. Chol literally means hollow. A chalil is a kind of uh, flute or something. A machul is the circle dancing. What is the relationship to forgiveness to hollow? That when one person is offended by another, whenever they see that the person who offended them, they see the offense. They don't see the person. They say, that person owes me $5. So the $5 becomes a clog in their opportunity to have a relationship. It's something that's blocking him because whenever I see it, that's the person who insulted me. That's the person who owes me money. That's the person who, uh, whatever it was. So when there is mechila, then that completely hollows out. And that's the message of why a flute, I mean, if you blow on a, on, on a stick, it doesn't make any music. If you hollow it out and you blow the breath, now there can be music flowing through the the hollow so the, the alternative or the the the, the mechila is a remedy for clogging and the clogging is the blockage between two people's relationship or hashem and a person's relationship where instead of seeing the other person they simply see the clog the the thing that's in the way that's what they see and therefore they are um, disturbed constantly by that uh, relationship. Okay, so if a person misses a mitzvah opportunity, um, they can do tshuva and uh, they are forgiven. Now, as we'll nuance this out a little bit later in the chapter, this would seem to suggest that, well, it's not such a big deal because it's simply repairable. Alternatively, though, as we'll explain it, but in a certain sense, it's so bad that there's nothing you can do about it. That's it. I mean, there's no value. That's it. It's, it the mitzvah opportunity is passed. You know, the person didn't eat matzah, the mitzvah opportunity is passed. The person didn't shake the lulav, the mitzvah opportunity is passed. The person forgot to pick you up for whatever they said. That's it. It's passed. They can't do it now. There's no way to make up for it. So it's so bad that there's no point in there being any further uh, impact because there's nothing that can be done about it. So we'll, we'll venture into that later on. Right now, we're sticking just to the legality of it as well. Of Ra Mitzvah's Lisa say, what if a person actively violates a prohibition? They do something they shouldn't have done. They eat something that's not kosher. They say something they shouldn't say, and so on. So now they've actively engaged uh, tshuva, toila. So tshuva will suspend uh, the impact of it. The Yom Kippur and Yom Kippur will ultimately atone. If you recall, way back in in the uh, uh, chapter eleven of the Sefer Shal Beinanim, the Alter Rebbe describes the Beinani as, uh, well, he's really talking uh, about the Russia there, about the Russia who's done in Avera. And it leads into the Benini, in fact, in chapter 12. In chapter 12, <clears throat> the Alter Rebbe says that a Benini is defined as a person who has never done an Avera. So we ask the question, okay, I guess I could put this book away because, you know, 35 years ago, I looked out the window during davening, and that's it. I ruined it. It's broken. So what is the point of my uh, even keep keeping on reading? So Alter Rebbe explains there that a person can do tshuva. 
And then he adds another little nuance, a level called Hashem Yislach Loi. Translation, Hashem will forgive him. So we explain that there's really kind of two stages in tshuva. And again, this we could probably relate to at the human level as well. One is the person has remedied the wrong. So a very simplistic analogy. I lend somebody money. They don't pay me back. They violated their obligation. I pursue them. I yell at them. I cajole them. They pay me back. Okay. So the thing has been remedied. But the relationship has not been remedied because tomorrow when he asks me to borrow $5, I'm not so down with lending him another $5 because I, I have had a bad experience. So while it's true that the person doesn't owe me anything, there is no thing, but we are certainly not reinstated to where we were because once upon a time, I did lend him $5. But he's damaged the relationship to the point that I will no longer lend him $5, even though he doesn't owe me $5 anymore because he paid me back. So this greater level is called Hashem Yislach Loi. Hashem will forgive him. And again, just to get a little bit ahead of ourselves, when it says Yom Kippur will atone, which is what we just read, how does Yom Kippur atone? So we explain because this is what we experience on Yom Kippur, that we become so aligned with the infinity of Hashem that not only are we not going to be penalized because you did tshuva. So the tshuva is like paying back the $5 two months late. I have already repaired the damage. But there's still this lingering uh, 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 injury to our relationship. And that only becomes repaired when there is uh, Yom Kippur. Because on Yom Kippur, we become elevated to such a, an intense level of closeness with Hashem that our behavior ceases to have any uh, impact and we get like a hard reset back to our original identity and connection with the infinity of Hashem. Uh, Perish, we're in the parentheses, the Afa God's Indian Kiyomitsis essay. Now, here the Alt Rebbe addresses an oddity. And again, this is still in the, the mentality, and it's important that we remember that we're talking here about a legality, the halachas of tshuva, because it has halachic rules, just like uh, kosher and mezuzah have halachic rules. So in the, in the fulfillment of mitzvahs, we have a rule that doing a mitzvah can override a prohibition, as we'll explain. So here we have a, a curious halachic dynamic. If we look at the repair side, it appears that violating a prohibition is much harsher than missing an obligation because missing an obligation is seemingly more easily repairable, quote, unquote, all you got to do is tshuva, and then presto changeo, you have reinstated, whereas if a person actively violates, there has to be penalty, and from penalty, there goes to, uh, to tshuva. So this would suggest, again, that active violation is harsher than omission. However, we have a rule of thumb that there are mitzvahs that could sometimes override a navera, and we would, we would execute the mitzvah even in defiance of the, quote, avera. Most obvious example that we all are aware of is, uh, I'll use the word violating, though it's not really a violation, is that we violate Shabbos to save a life, meaning we have an obligation to save lives. We have a prohibition of violating Shabbos if, God forbid, we get a circumstance where a person's life is in danger, we emphasize the mitzvah of saving lives over the Avera of violating Shabbos. Or uh, another simple example, if uh, a Kohen sees a lost item in a cemetery, so Kohanim aren't allowed into cemeteries. Is he allowed to go into the cemetery to return the lost item? So, Or is he allowed to bury the dead if the person has no one else to bury him. It's called a mace mitzvah. Now, you know, in our society, we don't have that because we make phone calls, we have barrels, but conceptually, 
if a Kohen was faced with a dead body that nobody else could bury except him, so the mitzvah of burial would override the prohibition of the Kohen coming in contact with the dead, et cetera, et cetera. So how does this work? On the one hand, it seems that doing a mitzvah is, quote unquote, more important than not doing the Avera, as evidenced by these scenarios where you have a conflict and we default to the mitzvah. The mitzvah overrides the Avera. On the other hand, if a person misses out on doing a mitzvah, the repair seems to be, quote, much easier than if he actively violates an Avera. So what we see from here is that we should not engage in these uh, analyses because we don't always have the understanding of what the impact is. So we cannot do this reverse engineering and say that from the punishment we can deduce which is the greater and which is the lesser. Because, as we say, that when you do a mitzvah and you make the bracha, which you all recognize, that Hashem has made us holy. So by doing the mitzvah, we are uh, transforming our uh, identity, our godliness. And as such, we are um, uh, uh, elevating our neshama more than through avoidance. I mean, again, you think about this even in physical health. What is more important, not to eat junk or to exercise? You know, it's, they're both valuable. They ha have different values. And so one is the avoidance of the unhealthy, not to eat bad foods. And the other is the pursuit of the healthy through uh, proper exercise or whatever it may be. Okay. Aval in Yinshuva, when it comes to Chuva, so here we're going to have this opportunity for waiver of non compliance. He rebelled against the king and he did not do what the king said. So we have, uh, again, uh, you know, this rule of thumb. It doesn't, quote unquote, matter what the Aveira is, like it doesn't, quote unquote, matter what the mitzvah is. Every mitzvah is introduced with the same bracha. Even if it's a, quote, big mitzvah, small mitzvah, this uh, uh, magnitude measure is really our own human perspective. We tend to think that this one is important and that one is less important. I'll share a, a quick story. In the late 60s, there was uh, a, two Chabad rabbis who were on like a, a, a TV show. And that was like really big stuff, you know, secular show. And they were interviewing them and, you know, guys with beards and on a TV and they speak English. And it was like kind of a cool thing. And uh, two Lubavitchers you know, very prominent people. And the Rebbe talked about it because there was one question that was a little one of those, uh, a little uncomfortable. The interviewer asked them, you know, what's with all the death penalty for this and that? Like, it's so harsh. And they gave an answer that was a little bit of like uh, apologetic. Well, you know, it would have to be with two witnesses and a court that executed two, even one person in 70 years was considered a bloody court. You know, they kind of fumbled around the question like, well, that never really happened anyway, so it's not such a big deal. Something along those lines. So the Rebbe spoke about this, and the Rebbe gave a different answer. So the Rebbe said, imagine, this was right around the time of the space launch, 1969, the landing on the moon. So that was, of course, in everybody's mind. He says, imagine if the astronaut would get into the, into the spaceship, the rocket, and they'd start touching buttons. He said, what are you doing? He said, well, what's the big deal? I just touch a button. Well, because you don't understand what this button is connected to. And this is not yours. You are here to fulfill a mission. So uh, uh, an astronaut, the soldier, understands that this isn't mine to, to do what I think, because I don't think it's such a big deal that I touch this button. Right? So you don't understand. This button, what this button is connected to. And fundamentally, the issue is this is not yours. You are here on a mission. Your obligation is to follow the mission and uh, comply with the instructions. 
So we may look at a, a certain behavior and say, well, what's the big deal? You know, quote unquote, why are they making such a big deal out of it? Well, the pushback is because we don't understand what the impact is when we push this button and that button. You know, we've all learned this with technology. You know, why is it so frustrating? Well, you put the wrong word in, you get the wrong answer. And so on. So this becomes a, a, an opportunity for us to have a little insight into the impact of Averas, even if it, quote unquote, doesn't appear to be so terrible. But right now, we're sort of struggling with a little bit of push me, pull me about the impact of non-compliance, omission versus commission. So we say, even though he has an easier tshuva, apparently, don't make the mistake of, of doing uh, an attempted reverse engineer and say, well, I guess that means it's not so bad if I miss doing the mitzvah. Because again, that's what we uh, superimpose onto the circumstance. We say that's not such a big deal. Mikol makam, because or nether. The ultimate consequence is that the light of Hashem, which we had the opportunity to bring into the world when we uh, when it was Pesach and to eat matzo or to say the morning Shema or to say good morning to somebody, and we missed that opportunity. like it says in the Gemara, al pasuk What are sins that can never be corrected? This is when we have ignored the opportunity to say the evening Shema. So this is for men, it's a time-oriented mitzvah to say the Shema when you lie down at night and when you rise up and in the morning. And if a person miss saying the Shema, which again may seem like, what's the big deal? It doesn't seem so terrible, but it's that's it. It's lost. It's ne It can never be retrieved. The Rebbe once used an analogy. It's like in business. In business, a missed opportunity doesn't come back. Sure, there'll be other opportunities. But that opportunity, when the customer walks into the store, okay, we don't have stores anymore, but if, if you remember back in prehistoric times when we had the stores, when the customer walks into the store, that's an opportunity. If he walks out of the store, that's a missed opportunity. That's it. He walked out, he's going down the street to buy whatever it is he needs. Sure, there'll be more customers tomorrow, but the successful business person sees every customer as an opportunity not as a um, uh, an infinite amount. You know, the, the difference between, the Rebbe once explained, the student and the person in business is the student. He studies, he studies. Tomorrow will study more. If he studies less, more. It's not such a quote-unquote big deal. But the business person understands that every day, that opportunity is that there for that day, and it ain't going to necessarily be there tomorrow or it definitely won't be there tomorrow, let's put it that way, because today's opportunity is there for today. Okay. Rabbi Epstein? Yes. There's like, like every minute of the day you could be learning and studying. That's correct. Well, every minute of the day, we should be aligned with the infinity of Hashem. Correct. So it's very difficult. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, you get tired, you're reading, you get tired, or you can, your brain just doesn't seem to feel like you can absorb anymore. That's correct. I mean, I use this as an analogy. Imagine your best friend is with you. And the and the person says, man, I have nothing to do. And the best friend, what do you mean you have nothing to do? I'm right here. Why don't you talk to me? So you always have something to do. Now, if you told your best friend, you know what? I'm really tired. I have to go to sleep. Hopefully, if they're your best friend, they're going to say, what do you mean? You have to stay here and talk to me. Well, I have to go to work now. No, you can't go to work. You have to stay here and talk to me. Understood. Right. You understand you have to go to work now. Again, to the, the, the concept, why do we go to work? Why do we do the dishes? Why do we eat? Because then we can spend time with our best friend. Because if I don't go to work, I'm not going to be able to pay for the things that I need to be able to spend time with my best friend. But if I say, you know, I had it with my best friend, I'm leaving. And thank God I get to go to work, you know, which is unfortunately how much of our society functions. We only have to look around in the broader society, especially at this time of year, when people are like, oh, man, I hate being home for the holidays. All we do is fight and yell and argue about politics and whatever so right so does the, does the person go to work so they can get away from their family or does the person go to work so they can be with their family so that's it's a, excellent analogy 
Thank you. Yeah, so th- that that helps us to to understand it. But right, I mean, there is that sense. Why, why is Hashem not forgiving if we waste time from Torah study? Because it's like you're sitting there saying, you know, I got nothing to do. You know, I'd rather you know watch TV than the, the you know nonsense than than uh, spend time with Hashem. So of course, then it's it's saying that that's not so important. But if I tell him, I, I, look, I have to go to sleep so I can get up in the morning and spend more time with you. Okay, everybody understands that. And this, Person's you know psychopath. But, okay, but Rabbi, one real quick thing, you you can bring your best friend with you to work. Well, That's it's hard to work, you know. If you you don't want your dentist doing your root canal with his best friend sitting there that he's talking to, you know. No, hello, but you can attention. be you can have a kindness toward them, or you can, yeah. uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do in in just interacting with with other people that brings your best friend there. Yeah, I mean, this is the point. Why are we going, you know, uh, uh, we're going to work in order to be with Hashem, not to get away from Hashem. Right, right. I mean, lots of ways to bring it in. If you're driving and you you let somebody pass and you didn't give them a hard way to go and you're driving, I mean, there's all kinds of little Hashem is everywhere and with us at all times. I mean, again, maybe we're all somewhat vulnerable to it, but, you know, we have those three-day yuntifs and it's like, man, I just want to go back to normal, you know. Can I just go to work? (laughs) All this godly time is, okay, it's intense. That's true. But it's really about the mentality and the perspective. You know, I'd really rather be here, but I have to be there. You know, this is what we're looking forward to with Mashiach when it says that the nations will support us in our service of Hashem. And they say, hey, we'll do that so you can do your thing. But we're not at that level yet. Okay. The option is, even if the person says, oh boy, I miss saying the Shema. And from now on, I absolutely resolve and I will never, ever, ever again miss saying the Shema. So they seemingly have turned it around and they've done it. But the bottom line remains, uh, Tuesday night Shema is never coming back. Even though they say Shema Wednesday and Wednesday night for the rest of their lives, that missed opportunity. I, I could just share one quick story, you know, um, in Chabad, one of the biggest trainings for all the yeshiva students is to go on mitzvahim and to try and get other people to do a mitzvah. Uh, so specifically, the, it began with the mitzvah of putting on tefillin, and from there it's expanded to every mitzvah, of course, Hanukkah now, and Lulav, and so on. And this has often run into some criticism from people like, why? what is the point of this? Why are these yeshiva students standing outside in the rain for two hours to maybe get one person or two people or 10 people to put on fill in one time. The guy puts on fill in one time. Why is this such a big deal? So in having this discussion with somebody once, I said to him, look, if you make a, 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 um, a summary, how many times will you put on fill in your life? You know, you bar mitzvah at 13. You put on fill in 300 days out of the year, minus Shabbos and Yontif. You live, God willing, 100 years. You do the math. It's a lot of times, you know, in the many, many thousands of times. What if you missed one time? You know, you got thousands and thousands. You got thousands and thousands minus one. Would it bother you? You know, minus one, what's, what's the big deal? So I said, that's the point. If you think that putting on fill in for yourself every single day is just one out of thousands of thousands, so, yeah, yeah, of course you do it and you strive to do it. But if you missed one time, you know, wouldn't be such a big deal. Then it's hard to appreciate why it's such a big deal. Because on that Tuesday, you have to put on to fill in once. And this guy in the street has to put on to fill in once. And if you don't put on to fill in once that day, and he doesn't put on to fill in once that day, it's the same impact. And if you put on to fill in once that day, the fact that you put it on the day before and the day after is not relevant. And therefore, you have to do it that day, and he has to do it that day. I, he didn't do it tomorrow, and he didn't do it yesterday. That's not relevant to Tuesday. That day is itself its own day. And if we could learn to cherish mitzvahs and every mitzvah opportunity and not, oh, here comes another one. There was a man, I mean, he had, can I know her, many children, many grandchildren. He had a very close relationship with the Rebbe. And he had a grandchild named Menachem Mendel. So he wrote to the Rebbe, we have a grandchild, a Mazel Tov, another Menachem Mendel. And the Rebbe like crossed out that word another. You know, it's not another. You know, no child is just another one. If somebody has, you know, Kanina Hara children, 
They don't think, well, you know, this one, that one. I got most of them, you know. Everyone is cherished. So to every mitzvah and every mitzvah moment should be cherished as well. So here, the Alter Rebbe is laying out, as he often does, just one of those uh, disequilibriators, kind of shakes up our way of thinking, by pointing out, on the one hand, there seems to be a, a greater severity to violations because they require more intense juva, in contrast to omissions, which are more easily remedied. On the other hand, it seems, so we go a little back and forth, so that now that you're sufficiently confused, we're ready to sort of open up to something beyond what we have already thought. So here we go. But Oye Brahm, it's as I say, what happens when we actively violate an Avera, we do something we shouldn't do, so we have now allowed some sort of evil to attach itself to us. This impact reaches all the way deeply into our very identity. It starts to taint our very core. You know, as we've talked about, <laughs> it's better to be a bank robber who doesn't rob banks than to be a good person who just happened to rob a bank. Because when he robs the bank, it, it, it impacts the entirety of his identity. Everything about him becomes shaken. We know this from physical food. I mean, hopefully nothing so extreme, but when food gets absorbed into our body, it shapes everything about our body. So if we eat something, maybe we get a little indigestion, hopefully nothing worse. God forbid it's something really bad. We just did it once, but it can impact the entirety of our existence, and it's very hard to extricate it from our, uh, from our system. So as we say, all neshamas, as we know, way back from the early chapters of the Seva Shalbaninim, every neshama has a sort of personality from the origin of Atzmas Orin Soif, all the way from its very origin till it trickles all the way down to be inserted in this particular person. So it goes through all of these different machinations and formations and uh, uh, adjustments and so on. And it's finally sort of dispatched from a certain world, a certain degree of awareness, the tzaddik comes from Atzilis and so on, and a certain one of the spheres that each person has their tendencies, this person's more strong in chesed, this person's more strong in gavur and so on. But even so, even if you get a neshama that comes from Malchus, the least personalized of the world of Asiya, the least aware, but it's all uh, 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 originated from that first source. Or, and if you trace it all the way back up, uh, up the ladder, it's all from that original source. So when a person does an Avera, I mean, it's sort of like the, perhaps I'm just thinking here about the analogy of of Chil Hashem, not that this is to justify people who have a bad impression about Jews based on one Jew's behavior, but there is a certain truth to it. That, and of course, the irony is from the most un-Jewish of behaviors and people who are least consciously associated with their Judaism, they create the biggest Chil Hashem. It's the old joke. Why is it every Jew does something worthwhile, changes his name to Smith? And everyone who's a low life has to be Weinstein and Madoff and Epstein, no relation, uh, and so on and so forth. Why can't those guys change their name to Smith? No, the guy who invents the cure for disease, he has to decide to be Smith and live in in in, uh, in Kenilworth. And the guy who's this low life has to live in Miami and uh, you know and be Yerachmiel Godalowitz. Okay. So what happens? Because there is a sense, right? They are related to related to related all the way through Moshe Rabbeinu, even though they may have no conscious awareness of their relationship. Um, therefore, therefore, they are dependent on Yom Kippur. What does Yom Kippur have to do with anything? So as we explain on Yom Kippur, the forgiveness on Yom Kippur is really irrational. Meaning, it sort of reminds us, you know, who's empowered to have forgiveness, the beseecher or the beseeched, you know, the violator or the violated. And ultimately, it's the violated. 
if a person says, well, I did this, therefore they should forgive me, that's not my call to make. Now, a person can be obstinate, like we are told, that if a person does it, if it uh, violates another person, he should ask for forgiveness. And the rule is he should ask three times. If the person doesn't forgive him, the sin is on him. Now, what does this mean? I'm sorry, you know, like a kid. Say you're sorry. I'm sorry. You know, it means the person is genuinely asked for forgiveness three times. And the person is so obstinate, that means that there's something about them. You I mean, it's at a certain point, it's not about the violator. It's about the violated. They are somehow so... Uh, relentlessly committed to holding on to this grudge that there's no way that there's going to be any forgiveness. So the sin is on them, meaning it's something about them. It's not about the violator anymore. And again, we're not just saying, you know, say you're sorry, I'm sorry, you know, that kind of childishness. We're talking about a genuine. So Yom Kippur means that Hashem miraculously, that is irrationally, uh, illustrates this level of love that he forgives us. In the, On Pesach, curiously, we read the Dayenus. Everyone is familiar. If God done X and not Y, Dayenu. And then after the Dayenus, there's like a summary. So how much more so should we be grateful that he did this and this and this? We run through the whole litany of all the things. And the last thing is that he built for us the base of his chosen house. And it adds, what, what that, which is the last of the Dayenus, had he not built for us the chosen house, Dayenu. And then we end, he built for us the chosen house to forgive us for our sins. So we asked the question, why do you say that? What about all the other things we did at the Beis HaMikdash? So we say, because forgiving us for our sins is the ultimate illustration of love. Meaning, if you went into a restaurant and you had a bad experience, that's it. You don't go anymore. You don't write letters. That's it. You're not interested. You have completely severed that relationship. You're not interested in dealing with that place anymore and you move on. Where is forgiveness? Where there is a relationship. I mean, when I want to sustain the relationship, then I pursue forgiveness. If I'm not interested in pursuing the relationship, there's not there's no value in my asking for forgiveness. What do I need forgiveness for? I'm not interested in continuing the relationship. So the ultimate illustration of Hashem's love for us and us for Hashem is the idea of forgiveness, which is manifest in Yom Kippur, which is why, as we talk about Yom Kippur, it's not Tisha B'Av, it's not a time of sadness, we're not fasting to hurt ourselves. We are completely isolating our humanity so that we can focus exclusively on our spirituality. So this is what it says. That he will atone for us from our tumma and from our flaws, our negligences. Lifnei Hashem Titaru. On Yom Kippur, we experience this miracle, a level of lifnei Hashem. Now, again, we know that each of the names of Hashem, as we discussed a lot in Shaykh Vamuna, is a, a illustrative of how Hashem is relating with us. But there are still names, just like we all have names. We have names that we give, to, our children call us parent, the cashier calls us customer, the pilot calls you passenger. Those highlight the, the relationship, but it doesn't even touch on who am I in my very essence. What is my very identity? That's the level called Lifnei Hashem, even more personal than the name that we can't even pronounce because it's not a word of Yud Kei That's what we experience on Yom Kippur. That's why we wear white. That's why we don't eat. We don't want to me- we don't want to mess it up. Lifnei Hashem Daika Lechein. Therefore, in Lumen Mikan Shum Kula Chas Hashem Mitzasesu Befrapet And that's why the Alter Rebbe is here warning us. Don't make this mistake of making some sort of cheshbin, some sort of analysis as to what's bad, what's good. It's not so bad because you see, I, you know, I can get away with it. Now we all probably have encountered people who live their lives that way. Meaning, what's the least amount I got to do when I won't get yelled at? What's you know, what can I do? And then I'll figure out a way and I'll get away with it, and so on. So if if that's your life's objective like we talk about in the beginning of the book of the Intermediate Man, if your goal in life is to make sure you go to heaven, you're probably not going to like Tanya too much. If your goal in life is what's the least amount I got to do when I can get away with it, how can I spend my days getting away with it, then you're probably not going to like, uh, you're probably not going to like uh, this idea of a Geras HaTshuva. Because like we said with Torah study, Hashem will forgive somebody for idolatry 
but not for wasting time from Torah study, like we talked about. Idolatry is a momentary um, indulgence. I, wasting time from Torah study is saying, don't bother me. I, I don't want to be bothered with you. How much I got to do and you'll leave me alone? And that attitude is almost unforgivable. You know, love me, hate me, but for God's sakes, don't be indifferent to me. That is, Hashem will potentially waive the penalty for these harsher averas that carry these terrible consequences, but not for not studying Torah. And again, the idea of not studying Torah means not connecting with Hashem when I have the opportunity. And again, not because I'm tired or I have to go to work or whatever it may be. Simply because I don't want to be connected with you. Alva Christus Umisis Bezdin, back to the Talmudic source, that if a person violates uh, an, a, an Aveira that carries with it severance, that is, that the person should have to uh, pass away at an early age, certain Averas, or literal, that the court puts him to death, real harsh stuff. Uh, again, Chuva, Yom Kippur in Thailand, so he can do Chuva. Yom Kippur will suspend the punishment. The assume American, and if he has difficulties in life, this can cleanse it up. This is why, if God forbid, somebody has a difficulty, we tell them it should be an atonement. At least they should have something. It should it should eradicate. It should it should uh, brush it up. So any one you know, when the kid's brushing his teeth, he's screaming, "Ah, oh, it hurts!" When he brushes, you wash his hands vigorously. Ah, oh, I don't like it. The path is too hot. Whatever it is, it's that form. It needs to be brushed vigorously to be cleaned. Perush gave him akapara. This will complete the atonement. This is, touches on what we talked about before, that particularly as Hasidus defines it, the objective of punishment is not punitive, it is reparative. It's that opportunity for the person to find the godliness within it. That's what it's for. To uh, to help us understand or transform or uh, repair and so on, not just to be punitive. The word kapara, we translate as atonement, most literally translates as vigorously scrubbed. Vigorously scrubbed. Like it says, I will rebuke him with the stick. Pisham for their negligences, Ubinagoyim Avoinam, and the impact of their sins, Ad Khan Lushan Habraisa. Here too is the quote from this, what's called a Brisa, which came a little bit after the Mishnah, but before the Gemara, that we quoted from uh, the Masechta in Yuma. So we'll stop.